Good evening, everyone. And welcome to Chess Forum. Uh, tonight we have a special event uh, about French artist Marcel Duchamp, and it couldn't have been a more suitable or appropriate place to hold this event. Uh, the founder of this place was a Russian grandmaster, actually Ukrainian, uh, called uh, Mr. Rosolimo, who ran this place until 1976 when he died. Before that, this place used to be on Sullivan Street. And on Sullivan, uh, the artist Duchamp and Rosolimo, Nicholas de Rosolimo, used to play chess all the time. As you might have heard, that was, uh, Duchamp gave up art to become a chess player. I think he said every chess player is an artist, but not necessarily every artist is a good chess player. So it's really a fantastic event to hold in this place, considering the history that uh, Duchamp is connected to this place directly or indirectly. Uh, and uh, I think this would be a great event just to introduce the last work of Marcel Duchamp. And thanks to the Greenwich Village Society for Historical Preservation that make these events possible. And to Mr. Harry, uh, who will introduce the event and the artists. Welcome and have, hope you have a good time. Thank you very much. I'm Harry Bowens with Greenwich Village Society for Historic Preservation. We're the largest membership organization from the West Village, NoHo to East Village, working to preserve the architectural heritage and, and cultural heritage of our neighborhoods. And we're a membership-driven organization, so I encourage you to join us. Um, Duchamp is the, the jump-off, and his, his uh, life in the village is the, the starting point. But we're really here because of artist Serkan Oskaya, who has a piece right now nearby. Um, Serkan is a conceptual artist who often works outside the realm of traditional art spaces. His latest art uh, explores Marcel Duchamp's last sculpture that or installation that was found in his studio at the St. Denis Hotel. Serkan has recreated it on location right now, um, uh, available by appointment, and then it's going to be at his gallery uh, the Postmaster's Gallery in the very near future. Um, uh, he likes to work outside of museum and gallery spaces and he studied Istanbul and Bard and did you finish your PhD? Mm -hmm. In German uh, comparative literature. Um, his Dear Sir or Madam work is a collection of letters between him and art institutions. For example, with the Louvre he asked to hang the Mona Lisa upside down. Um, I haven't read the, the interchange about that. Um, his replica of Michelangelo's David made a splash, falling and crashing into pieces upon installation for the 9th International Istanbul Biennial. You might have seen it then recreated and paraded through the streets of New York City on a flatbed truck and route to a hotel in Kentucky where it's installed right now. Um, today I downloaded his app, My Moon. I encourage you to look it up. My Moon, it's an app, really genius, and that's just by way of saying Sarkhan's involved in a lot of things in a variety of uh, formats, and we're really uh, honored to have him here today. He's going to discuss his work that's available right now nearby to, to view by appointment, uh, and the village, and Duchamp, and whatever else they care to talk about, with Robert Fitterman. Uh, Robert's a poet, considered a conceptual poet, and sometimes works in collaboration with fellow artists and encourages his students at NYU here and Bard to be active participants and not just partic not just uh, to be not just passive participants in our world to be active. In one interview, he's quoted uh, thus: "Experimental poetry has a long shelf life. Even if the community is small, the conversation could be vital to the future of art." He's the author of numerous collections of poetry, he teaches at Bard and NYU, as I said, and he's collaborated with Sir Ken and others on the latest journal of public attendant A to Z, which is available for purchase tonight. So without further ado, let's welcome him. said he gave up on art in order to play chess. That was kind of a disinformation. That was a facade that he put on. And then he was on his studio on 14th Street, actually, uh, between 7th and 8th uh, Avenues. And he built this 
door that would open both ways. And then in the main room, when you entered the, his studio, he would only have a chess set and a couple pictures, and he greeted his guests. And then uh, there was a bathroom, and after the bathroom, that double-sided door operated, and then opened to this secret room where he uh, worked on his last piece, which, which is called Attendant A. And uh, I mean, Rob calls it Attendant A. Like, it's in French, it's uh, Etendonne, like the given facts. But uh, when I was working on it and telling you about that, you also heard Attendant A. Like an attendant. Like toilet so, attendant. Yeah. So that's what we call the, uh, our publication, actually, attendant A to C. Uh, so it, it's so it's not completely true that he gave up on art. He worked on this last piece of his uh, for many years and a couple other uh, smaller pieces as well. And then he, uh, after working on it for maybe 18 years. In the 14th Street studio, he brought it uh, to this space on 11th Street, the building you mentioned, uh, Saint Denis, uh, at the corner of 11th Street and Broadway, and he installed it there. And uh, only his, apparently, only his wife, Tini Matisse, and his uh, stepson, Paul Matisse, were aware of it. And maybe one more person, but uh, he hadn't seen it. So after he died, they found it on the uh, on the building 80 in East 11th Street uh, in the room 403. And when I spoke to Paul Matisse, uh, he remembers the space and he said it, there were the building was occupied by a lot of like accountants, small offices, and so on. And now today, and then I you know I managed to rent that uh, particular space after I built a one-to-one -one basically replica or a recreation of the, of the whole installation and I installed it there. And today uh, the building is mostly healers, doctors, uh, a lot of psychiatrists and yoga studios and whatnot. Um, the other uh, kind of uh, very small mistake is that display has ended, that uh, I showed it to a few people in the uh, last two weeks, and my show is open uh, right now. It opened uh, this last Saturday at Postmasters Gallery, yeah. so you're welcome to go uh, and check it out. Yeah. It's in Tribeca. It's on Franklin Street between Broadway and Lafayette. So, the key component that's missing in this conversation, I think so far, is that it's not simply a replica of uh, the shops of Tribeca. But um, Sirkin had this idea um, that it might be a camera obscura. So in other words, uh, if you know the piece and you go to the Philadelphia Art Museum, you walk into a room and you see an installation. It's about maybe from here to those cabinets. Um, and you go to a wooden door and you peek in and you see a scene of a, a naked woman um, perhaps uh, after a rape scene, it's unclear, uh, and a waterfall and a, a lantern and some other uh, things of uh, a kind of meadow scene. No one had considered that maybe what was happening is if you turn out the lights, that what got projected out of the holes might be significant. And um, for me, I always felt like there was something strange about Etanone because I felt like it was very face value, which for Duchamp would be strange. Mm -hmm. um, since all of Duchamp's work kind of pulls your leg in one way or another. It seemed to me, I don't know that, I didn't know, now I didn't, I didn't know very much about the piece, but I did think that it was strange to accept it on face value. <laughs> so one day, um, Sir Ken was, uh, well, you could uh, explain this part better experimenting in his bathroom, um, <laughs> a very tiny uh, version, and realized that maybe there's a camera obscure. If you actually if you turn off the lights, you might see an image projected out of the room rather than the spectator looking into the room. Um, 
Sirkin approached the Philadelphia Art Museum about um, the project and if he could go there and turn off the lights and that he had this hypothesis that there might be a camera obscura involved. And uh, they said no, um, <laughs> for various reasons, mm -hmm. mainly that the Marcel Duchamp estate uh, would disapprove. So um, I'm leaving out several parts, but over the years, then Sirkin decided to actually had no choice but to recreate the uh, installation on scale so that we could see for ourselves whether it was a camera obscura, and in fact, it is. The image that was presented from the tiny thing that I saw a couple of years ago that came out of Sirkin's bathroom and into his studio, which was maybe this big, like That's a shoebox, yeah. was very clear right away yeah, it was like, oh, that's Rose Salavi, who was the persona, the uh, female persona. And it had the floppy hat and all. I, mean, so I did say that right away, right? So, uh, so I was sold on the wonder of the project. Um, and you could see for yourself uh, at Postmaster what the image is, but it's very clearly an image that, in my opinion, Duchamp. Uh, intended and had fun with. So I, I can I jump in? Oh, please stop. Uh, I hadn't yeah. seen the work. I mean, I grew up in Istanbul, Turkey, and for us, uh, Dushan was a very important figure. I mean, we didn't. I mean, in the eighties and nineties, early nineties, and we didn't really have international collections or anything. So, we, and God knows how I got interested and in, in this kind of work or how I collected information about it. But I also managed to find a few other people in the town that were also excited about these, this, you know, let's just call it conceptual art. And we would find that, you know, Xerox, black and white Xerox page from a magazine in a language we wouldn't understand, but we would get very inspired by it. And Duchamp was the main figure because all, almost all his work is appropriate for translation. Like, you don't even have to see a picture. You can hear about the story of it, and you understand what the work is. Like, you can grasp it from one picture. You can grasp it from even the idea. It's very uh, appropriate for translation, I would say. Except for this last piece. A tandone is something that you have to be there. You have to be present in, you know, and see and look at the work and so on. So it always, you know, uh, kind of bugged me, uh, and I had never seen it. And like Rob described, there's, a, it's like look, you're looking through the peephole on a door, and you're looking inside. You're inside of the museum, and you're looking ever, you know, more inside of the museum. But it's as if you're looking outside. It's like uh, bathed in light. It's brilliant scene, and so on. And I had not seen the piece when I had the idea. Uh, that it's a closed chamber, lots of light in there, and two little peepholes that sound like a camera obscura to me. You know, like why don't we turn the lights off in the museum? Uh, so right after I, I went to Philadelphia to check it out, because every time I have an idea, I also have cold feet the next day. And first I was like, oh, maybe the light is not enough. The peepholes are, you know, not small enough, or you know, some other reason. And then, of course, always, you know, you always have somewhere back in your head that oh, somebody must have uh, come up with this idea because it's such a well-read uh, and, you know, written about peace. There's, there's a book about the waterfall in the background, for instance. Um, <laughs> and there's a lot of literature. Anyway, so uh, it passed all these tests, and, you know, the light was enough, the pupils are perfect. And, uh, and then, so I made a little model, uh, one to 10 model. So the installation is not huge. So the one to 10 model was like you described, like a shoe box. And the only place that I could isolate the lights uh, was my bathroom, as Rob said. So uh, late one night I took a picture and then what I didn't really calculate with was that there were two people. So the image is not only one image. I was expecting an upside down version of what's inside. But in fact, it's like two upside down versions of the inside 
uh, superimposed. So they come together and form a totally different composition. Mm -hmm. So that's how I, so it was unexpected. I mean, it wasn't my intention to you know, come up with a meaningful something, and it resembled a face. And I showed it to you, and then Rosella V, could, could it be? And then uh, I called the museum, and they were, in the beginning, they were very enthusiastic. So I went there, they came to my studio, and then we, you know, uh, started planning on a test at the museum. And then all of a sudden, after maybe six months of negotiations, they decided this would present a, an intervention, an artistic intervention, basically, so they can't, they can't even try it out. So then I built my own, own uh, recreation mm -hmm. of that. And then I uh, also had the idea of, well, maybe uh, there's something in the studio that tells you about the distance, because once you have that camera obscura, the distance from the surface of the projection to the people is, becomes very important, and the, the darkness, and you know, all those things, and then I installed it there, and it works. So, uh, now it's at the gallery. That's in a nutshell. And, but I, it's true that I hadn't seen the piece until I had that, this idea. I only knew about it. And then we reached out to so many experts. There are a lot of, uh, as you can imagine, a lot of experts on not only Dushan, but also about on this uh, particular uh, uh, masterpiece, um, including like Michael Taylor, or Penelope, or Alain Bidou, or, or Julian Paladin, and they all contributed to this publication. Of the what are the things, um, just to broaden the scope <coughs> of the piece, I think, of one of the things that's really interesting about it is that I think Sirkin and I both come from an interest in art that uses a lot of borrowing and appropriation. And we both thought a lot about replica and copying. Um, one of the things that's really interesting about this particular piece is that it is a replica. It's not really an, it's not an appropriation. Um, in other words, we're not, uh, it, Sirkin's not using a tambone and torquing it in some way that creates a critique or that we would think about a tambone in a different way. I think rather it is a kind of curiosity um, and it's a new way to think of, of replication, I think, because it's a replica in order, A, to, to, in two ways. One, it's a replica in order to reveal something about the original. <clears throat> it's a really interesting thing, I think, when you think about appropriation. How do you reveal something more original than the original? Right? I mean, sometimes that's just a question of bringing it into a different time in a different context, right? But how does something become more original than the original, A? And B, it's a kind of, there's no way around it being a kind of institutional critique in that had the Philadelphia Art Museum allowed him to do this, the piece wouldn't exist probably. That's right. right? So it was really a, a, a very a conceptual gesture that had to be materialized. Uh, so it has both of these elements, if you see it. Uh, it's a very conceptual uh, project on lots of ways in terms of thinking about all of the parameters around the piece that are not the piece itself. But actually the piece itself is quite extraordinary because it really looks exactly like a time and it's not trying to look different. In fact, some of the materials, like the lantern, I know Sirkin went out of his way to get the same lantern or, or as close as possible from France, the only light guy who has a museum France and was very proud of his turn of the century lanterns. Um, right, so they're using that kind of lantern. The materials when they can, you know, be Yeah, it through. was, yeah, there were a lot of, you know, steps one had to go through uh, because you can't, you don't have access to the material of the work. Mm -hmm. Not even the curators can go in to that room mm -hmm. in Philadelphia. So there's only one technician who only goes in there when something, something breaks. Because there's an animated holding the back and the lantern she's holding in her hand from 1800s. 
and I needed to get that lantern, and I was looking at the options, like how to replicate it. First was for eBay, uh, no luck. And then I found it in this museum of non-electrical lighting in Paris. And I wrote to this guy in, my French is really bad, so I wrote him in, in English. And the next day he replied in perfect Turkish. And it turns out, turns out he's an Armenian collector who moved to Paris 40 years ago first started collecting all these you know, uh, old lamps and uh, gas lamps and stuff, and then opened his own museum, and then he sent me one. And I tried it in the installation, but it felt a little too big, so apparently he sent me the larger model, so I needed to get the smaller model as well, and so he sent me the second one as well. So it uh, came from a museum, but that's, I think, I feel like my replica, if you will, is all fake except for that one lantern, that piece of glass. Everything else is uh, improvised. I mean, uh, especially the figure, that was very hard to get um, right. Uh, and I, I mean, there's all these stories. Like he, he uh, the, probably the whole piece is kind of like an homage to his lover, uh, 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 Maria Martins, that, who was the wife of the Brazilian ambassador in, in New York. And they, with Dushan and her, they had a you know uh, relationship for five years, and then she left him and went back to her husband. So he was devastated, apparently, but in the meanwhile, he managed to get a mold of her, and then he got the cast. And um, and so that's what we see, We I imagine, like through the peepholes, a cast of a you know, human being. Uh, a petite woman, and then over the years, one of uh, the arm that's holding the lantern broke, and then th by that time he was married to Tini Matisse, uh, so he took the mold of her arm and replaced the, the lover's arm with the, with the wife's arm. Um, so I found a you know a person whom I thought would be kind of uh, in similar proportions, and then I got the mold and cast didn't look anything like it for the people. So it was totally, uh, you know, disaster. So in the end, I took all these pictures and also some research uh, from um, um, art, one art historian, Melissa, I can't remember her last name, but it's very uh, technical. So she had all these dimensions, like all the, uh, like from nipple to nipple, from uh, top of the shoulder to the arm and so on. So those dimensions plus the pictures Marcel Duchamp took, and we put them all together, and you know it's like a detective work, and then 3D model it, and then I got it 3D printed. That was the only way sort of to get it right. Um, I mean, other than trying with a you know a real cast and slicing it and uh, adding up to it. So that's that's another fake. So yeah, I would say the lantern is the only only part that was uh, authentic, plus the studio here. You know that was the that was the site. But copying, I think, it really is a different activity. It's like it's like tracing. I mean, you know it uh, probably better than me. But it really conveys a knowledge which is not accessible elsewhere. I mean, I'm not, we are not like Duchamp experts, but now I feel like I have a certain knowledge that, you know, uh, nobody else has, at least about that particular piece. Because you're like, you know, you're tracing it, tracing it. The journal, um, so we started the journal a couple of years ago, and um, it, uh, the, it was strange that the, the piece, uh, I think Serkin had the idea that it would always have a kind of text component um, from the very start. So I know, so Serkin was keeping a lot of notes. And then he wanted me to be a kind of ghost writer for a kind of faux detective story, hard boiled detective story of a detective who discovers, who's actually hired by Serkin as maybe Duchamp, it's really a kind of funny story, and then this kind of schleppy 
detective guy who um, goes to Philadelphia and tries to solve this mystery. Um, so we, we were working on that. We were working with uh, Sir Ken's notes, trying to think about maybe doing a collection of uh, drawings, uh, notes, um, thoughts, and this story. Um, so this is the very early part uh -huh. before we even really went to Philadelphia, actually. Uh -huh. Um, and then we were invited by public uh, uh, journal in Canada, the art journal, um, to, well, Sirkin was invited to do whatever he wanted, and, and we decided to uh, um, invite uh, artists, scholars, and poets and writers uh, to respond in any way that they wanted to about this piece and everything that was happening around it. At the time, uh, you were still working on the model, so it wasn't it wasn't completed. They were just working off of a, an idea, um, and it turned out that there were a lot of Duchamp scholars that were super interested in this project, and maybe almost none of them really like turned their nose up at the idea of a camera obscura. Everyone seemed excited by this until uh, until I built it, and then mm -hmm. until they were. Uh, inquired by the press and so on. So a lot of the people who helped me actually building it stepped back once they were, you know, called by the, you know, New York Times or something like that. They, they, Interesting. Yeah, they don't want to have an opinion. They didn't want to have an opinion. About the, I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah. So each artist, we invited 26 artists, writers, poets, um, to, we assigned them a letter of the alphabet. Uh, so it's attendant. A to Z. Uh, we sent them a letter of the alphabet and we gave them a prompt uh, related to that word, that letter, right? Like A for anagram. Um, and um, they went to work and we went to work editing and it creates another dimension. That's the only reason I'm bringing it up. Uh, it, it creates another, it gives it a kind of context that it wouldn't have otherwise. Uh, that's really interesting because a lot of I think when you're dealing with historical work, a historical work that is of such great importance as Tango um, it's interesting to, I, I think, to, to extend that um, relationship, a relationship with scholarship. It was also kind of using it for our purposes, too. Like with the anagram, for instance, it's like I, I always thought the, the, the uh, title of the piece is a rhythm. It's, it starts like a rhythm, like givens, one, the, you know, the, one, uh, the waterfall to the illuminating gas. So you have these pieces, you know, do whatever you want to do with them, and solve the rhythm, as it were. Uh, and Duchamp never left any notes, like conceptual notes on the piece, uh, zero. And, uh, but he left a beautiful manual of instructions, which is a guide to how to reinstall the piece, how, how he built it and how it should be put together. So that was super helpful. But then again, on the facts or on the question of how to look at it or what it means or what it is about, uh, which are kind of you know, um, unnecessary questions anyways, but then it, even like in a formal way, how to look at it, didn't leave anything behind. So we started with anagram, like what, what can we do with the title? So we invited a couple uh, better, you know, French speaking people and played with the letters and uh, came up with a, like, solutions or suggestions. And then B was what, uh, what I'm what used by Mathieu Marcier, who did this, uh, you know, uh, Duchamp made a replica of his own words in small size, uh, many versions of it. And Mathieu Marcier, this French artist, spent maybe like five years to make a replica of Duchamp's replica, and then it's, uh, it's widely available now. Uh, so he gave us his pictures and so on and so forth. So it was, I mean, it was collecting and creating another layer, layer but at the same time I felt like, okay, you know, grab this from this person. Maybe these guys can help us a little more. And I would just say that the title, uh, so it's we, we, uh, we Wait? We Will Wait. We Will Wait, right. Uh, so there's a lot of, I, I, I don't think one can ever be um, 
criticized for looking too closely at Duchamp's titles, right? Because they're notoriously full of double entendre and punnery, uh, which he loved, of course. And so we had a pretty great time, and it's it, it pretty, I, I think, in the end, kind of convincing or interesting ways to think about Atanane. And I think the idea of attending, uh, and of course, he's fluent in English, attending or, or an attendant um, became really interesting to us. In fact, also, we will wait, sorry, uh, we will wait uh, is also like a clumsy anagram of Atanane, Anatando. <coughs> And Etandone is also spelled in a weird way in the child's version. There's, normally there's no S in the end. It's like either with double E or uh, uh, there's no S here. So it's curious to think about this idea of waiting. Um, maybe when he made it, that yeah, he knew it would take some time to you know, wait uh, to, to have this discovery. Um, um, but also attending. Um, and, and to think of uh, the fountain, it's nice to see the sink outside. Uh, the urinal, um, as an attendant, as a one who attends to the bathrooms. Um, so we had a lot of fun thinking about the plenary of a time He also has a very famous phrase that he says, I would rather wait. 50 years after my death for the for my real audience. So when I got the studio at the uh, uh, 80 East 11th Street, I was bringing some stuff in, and one day I uh, wanted to carry some you know uh, s s uh, tiles, and the building was shut down. So I learned that Sundays the building is not open, so it's always shut down. So and then uh, when I was planning for the studio dates. Uh, somebody asked me what the dates will be, I said first two weeks of October, so October 1st to 15th, and then I checked the calendar, October 1st is a Sunday, so okay, October 2nd, uh, 14th. And then I looked, I was looking at the uh, Wikipedia page of Marcel Duchamp, and then the day he died was October 2nd, and, uh, and exactly 49 years ago uh, this year, and that was full 49, so it became 50 years dead. And that was yet another uncanny uh, coincidence that I felt like, you know, I got his blessing. <laughs> <laughs> Just for waiting. Yeah. <laughs> <coughs> uh, yes. Um, um, uh, first of all, was there anything about where it was on site on 11th, 11th Street that uh, told you anything about the dimensions? The solution. Mm, well, I mean, was it put in a place where, where you said, "Oh, if I did have the right light, it would show at the right place." Uh, yes, uh, because the studio is, you know, it barely fits the work. Uh -huh. It only leaves about like five oh, feet no for the for the distance from the wall, and five feet is pretty much, you know, when you're. Imagine the two people's right here, and you're holding a piece of vellum. What you have is two little projections on the vellum. So you keep going back, mm -hmm. they start growing. And then you keep going back, they start overlapping and growing mm -hmm. even more. And five foot is about, and which also happened to be the exact height of the people's as well. So it was a weird, perfect triangle. Uh, and after that five foot, it doesn't matter that much how far you go. But that was the that was the distance, and that worked out with the studio as well. So it was built for that site. You think? Um, it worked in that site. Another uh, funny coincidence, I would say, the work has you know in the 14th Street studio when he started, he uh, got this cutout of a, a vinyl or what do you call linoleum uh, flooring under the table. But then there were no uh, vinyls in his 14th Street studio. And years later, like 16, 18 years later, when he moved to the uh, 80 East 11, the studio was actually covered with uh, black and white vinyls. I mean, it's uh, probably a coincidence, but he might have also, you know, yeah, like that. Works. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
what were Duchamp's original plans for the piece? Like, did, did he have a, like, did he build it with something in mind? Mm -hmm. Was he going to sell it? Was he going to give it to a museum? Yes. He, I believe he's been in touch with a board member of Philadelphia Museum and uh, I think Cassandra Foundation. And I mean, that's what people say. I mean, we, we don't find it anywhere written by him or anything because he was very secretive about it. But then, you know, the, the uh, accepted version is that it was meant to go to Philadelphia Museum where his other work that one particular uh, space in there. Is yours going to? Uh, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, it seems like now that you're not going yeah. to rape the intent yeah. of the artist having yeah. to do an exhibit, yeah. you. Uh, well, it's, everything is possible, but I don't know. <laughs> um, I don't know how they feel about it, because it's, you know, uh, who said that? Uh, Benjamin, that uh, uh, museum and mausoleum uh, have more in common than just uh, mm. the sound. It's <laughs> <laughs> a shame. Um, I can't remember for well, I Obviously, you look through the peepholes, mm -hmm. you see mm -hmm. the back, mm -hmm. and you stand at the front, mm -hmm. and you smell and mm -hmm. see the wood. Or, remember there being walls though on either side are there uh, of course there are but they're not really visible they're so not the, visible yeah, but in the like studio flagged out. in the studio no and that's another fact that his work was also covered you know why would it be covered if you don't want to isolate the light you know he mm -hmm. covered it with uh, like velvet or some cloth uh, the yeah the, the parts because you're looking inside it's like uh, they're dark also, the other thing that creates the composition is the brick wall. You know, like uh, it's like three partitions in the work. Like there's the door, there's an empty space here, and then there's a brick opening, which actually makes the composition when you look back, you know, on the uh, screen. And then there's the installation, and then the backdrop, which is tilted, so it gives you the impression it keeps going. I don't remember. I haven't seen recently, but I don't remember there being a face on a woman. There's no face. I mean, so to me that's just something added if mm -hmm. it projects a face. Yeah. There's the hair. There's like a blonde Yeah, exactly. Hair. Yeah, you don't see her face. I'm not but talking about, no, we are not talking about her No, no, face. I understand. Yeah. He's, yeah. Re he's referring to Rosé Levy. Right. That face, but that also has mm -hmm. that kind of hair, but I don't, but the piece itself, this, the figure mm -hmm. in the woman's figure does not have a face. No, no, no. Nobody saw the face. Comment. Nobody saw the face because the lights were on. You had to turn the lights <laughs> off no, and no, turn no, around. No, no, no. We're not communicating. What I'm saying is in the actual piece, the Eton Donne, mm -hmm. the figure on the ground mm -hmm. is faceless. That's right. Yeah. And now you're saying nobody could see that camera obscura face which was projected out. Mm -hmm. It's just interesting that there's this hidden face that's being finally oh, projected out yeah. all these years yeah. later, and it's got that, and yeah. it happens to be Duchamp, mm. and the woman is nameless yeah. in the piece. Yeah. Yeah. Simple observation. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. I'm getting confused. Mm -hmm. Are both Rose Sevali and this blonde woman with no face mm -hmm. both projected, and there's a waterfall image? The word, I mean, the <laughs> image, it, the camera obscura is a curious thing. Like, it's, you're in the dark, you're looking yeah. at a uh, blurry image. And how many figures and are there? There's a party. <laughs> no, 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 I don't know. Like, you, you, can, you can project. You yourself. have to decide what you're <laughs> seeing in the camera obscura. It has nothing to do with what's in the installation in the box, yeah. And I think that lots of people have seen different things. It's not so distinctive that it's like one thing. I think that it looks a lot like the uh, a silhouette of uh, the Rose La Vie by Menret, right? with a uh, profile and a floppy hat. But it's it, it it's ghostly. There's not much, you know. A, a what is the screen. thing that was 3D printed? Oh, that's the figure inside of the inside box. the box. And is that visible? Yes, absolutely. Yes.
But it's not projected. Uh, it is upside down, but it overlaps with the other projection, so it just becomes a blurry, total different composition and different image. I think you have to see. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's recreated. Is yes. there any possibility that we can actually see any of this? Yes. You mean right now? Right now. <laughs> The gallery. It's open. The gallery's open. No, no, here. Right here, right? Yeah. Oh, we only have the magazine. Uh, which it doesn't, oh, have, it doesn't have the camera obscura. Um, the magazine doesn't like that. I mean, it's, yeah. it's, it's yeah. a different experience, and in many ways, maybe rather poetic, that something is being described that we can't see. So you, it can, you know, you all a dream, I don't know. Yeah. But it'd, it'd be interesting to actually see this, if anything exists, to see it. But it would limit your ability to fantasize among us, and that may be sad. But could, is there anything we could actually see? Okay. You really have to see it in the gallery. It's an installation. No, a photo of it. Anything. You can't really. You can't you can reproduce any images. The images can be reproduced. That way, yeah. they could reproduce any of these images they draw from that. No, okay. okay. Yeah. I went to go see it before this event, so I highly recommend going to see it in person. Okay. Uh, maybe you can say when it closes, so people have an idea, like the mm -hmm. hours of the gallery. I mean, I know it's closed first night, but when does the show actually end? Um, so maybe people can have a good time. Up until we'll November 25th. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Definitely go see it. The image I didn't see. This is a kind of commercial, I suppose. I could see yeah. the face. I saw more like mountains and thought it was like more like Mother Earth. So, yeah. I don't know. Maybe more interesting for us to go back for a second view. 54 fragments. Well, yeah. Now I have to go to the museum. Originally. 11 to 6. You mentioned that a man ray had. Uh, and then also, um, are you aware of the Steppheimer um, uh, painting that has, uh, it indicates the persona, the um, persona? It's not like a big side. Go back here and look yeah. at there. And then finally one day I did walk in. And so it's really quite astonishing. So to think that you then took it, you were not familiar with it from your own experience, but in a different way from your own experience as an artist going on in Turkey, to think that you had the idea that it could be a camera obscura is really thrilling and astonishing. I just want to congratulate much of a creative thinker, and now I'm really excited about taking a look at her journal after it takes it further. And he's still alive. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you say say la vie. Vie. Uh -huh. say la vie. Yeah. Would you say something about how this piece relates to the rest of your work? Um, yes. 
Um, I mean, I'm uh, like Rob was saying. It's uh, I like copies and I like fiction by itself, and I always felt like I learned life from fiction. Sometimes I actually confabulate. I, is it something I really experienced, or is it something I read about? Uh, I, I always felt like, you know, uh, writing, art, you know, all these like secondary uh, stuff about life was more important for me than life itself, basically. Mm -hmm. So I always like to tackle those things. And, and you know, like, um, I would say like probably 99% of the world doesn't have these, you know, Western art masterpieces around the corner. So you uh, develop a certain different relationship with those masterpieces because you're always in the you know the wrong place at the wrong time. Mm -hmm. You're not in the presence mm -hmm. of those things. You know, the, so the and that distance becomes kind of uh, important. And that distance is exactly what I've been trying to work on. And, and the distance between yourself and the work, the distance between uh, the reader and the piece, and I always wanted to, you know, situate myself as a reader rather than a writer, basically, or an artist, more like a viewer, more with the spectator, and that gives you a lot of freedom as well. That it's kind of uh, crushes you down and uh, with less, uh, let's say potency, but then it also gives you a lot of freedom as to own every piece of work in the world, and you're not bound to a certain style or, you know, certain expression or a certain um, characteristic. You can just play so with whatever you want. It's pretty eclectic. Yes. <laughs> well, we have time to linger and talk with the artists and the poets and each other. Uh, let's give a round of applause to everybody.